Well, on Facebook, we lost the feed for a little bit, but we got it back, so it's good. So I apologize for technical difficulties. You know, that's the great thing about technology, right? It's great when it works, and it's terrible when it doesn't. But uh, anyway, also, the Backyard Bible Clubs, I just wanted to point out, we weren't the only group that did Backyard Bible Clubs. I think there were like 10 groups around Pike County, maybe even more, that, that had kids. And, and I recognize some of those kids at other groups from our center shot ministry. Do you guys see those kids in there? That was pretty cool to, to see them. So yeah, that was pretty neat. So anyway, uh, that was a great thing. And as I, I told a bunch of people, I said, this is our only outreach for the entire year. This is all that we can do. And so it was a good thing to do that and to reach the gospel of Christ to the children. And, and that's a good thing. So, this morning, we're beginning a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians, and we've been in a sermon series in Psalms since April, and when we began that series in Psalms that we just finished last week, I went there because of what we were going through as, as a church, what we were going through as a community, what we were going through as individuals, you know, all this stuff that, that had started back in, in March, you know, we was going through this lockdown and all of that. Uh, and the series of Psalm then made sense because we were all needing to find comfort and to find stability for our lives. And what I realized the further we went along in Psalms is, was that Psalms are not relevant for, for tragic periods in our life. They're, they're relevant for everyday life. So you don't have to be going through a tra tragic time for Psalms to help you. They meet us and provide what we need in whatever circumstance we happen to find ourselves in. And I know that in the book of Ephesians, we will find help and direction for everyday life as well. Although Ephesians is a little more focused than Psalms. Uh, Psalms was like an open canvas that God painted this, this picture with a wide brush and, and met every need. It was written for Israel's worship service. And many people through the ages have found what they needed in the, in the scripture of Psalms. Ephesians, however, is a little different. It's a little narrower in scope. It was written for Christians. That is, those who are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. That's who this was written for, the book of Ephesians. It is about believers who are the church because the believers make up the body of Christ. The author of Ephesians is, of course, the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that. The Holy Spirit has written everything, but it was through the Apostle Paul that, that did the actual human writing. So he's the author. He gets the, the authorship. The book of Ephesians is, is an epistle. It's a letter. It was a letter that Paul had written to the church at Ephesus. It was, it was that, that's what he, he did. But not only is, did, what, did Paul write a letter to the church at Ephesus, this is what they call a circular letter. So when the church at Ephesus would read this letter and study this letter and take to heart what this letter was telling them from the Apostle Paul, they would send it on to the next church and the next region, and it went around to all the churches during that day. It's a circular letter. So that means in the city of Ephesus, there definitely was a church, an actual church. We know that Paul planted that church there in his second missionary journey. We do know that. Uh, and then we also know that he came back to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and uh, he stayed there about three years, and he was actually the pastor at the church at Ephesus for three years. Before he left, he appointed the, his young friend Timothy to take over and be the pastor at the church there in Ephesus before he moved back into his missionary journey. Now, what I find interesting about the church at Ephesus, I tell you what, the church at Ephesus had some big-name players there as pastors. Paul was a pastor there. Timothy was a pastor there. The Apostle John then, after Timothy, some time after Timothy, came to Ephesus, and he was a pastor at the church at Ephesus. And the neat thing is, John wrote Revelation, and he talked about the church at Ephesus there. And John wrote this about the Ephesian church, and actually this is Jesus speaking through John. And listen what, what, what it says about the, the church at Ephesus. Jesus says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. 
hmm, the church we're going to be studying here left their first love at some point. I want this to be a warning to us this morning. As a church and as individuals, let us not leave our first love, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not get so caught up in all this worldly things that we, we let them seduce us and, and, and put those things before Christ. Let's not allow the pursuit of happiness, fame, fortune, comfort, whatever pursuit you may happen to have, let that not get in the way and help you to leave the one who gave his life for you. Before I get into this morning's scripture, the last thing we need to know about the book of Ephesians is that the Apostle Paul is writing this book from prison. This is a prison epistle. He was in prison, and I tell you that because as we go through this book, as we, as we read each verse, and we study verse by verse, and as we get through that, just think about Paul's mindset. Think about where he's at. Think about the attitude he has while he's suffering in prison. And, and, and think about his outlook on life as, as he's suffering, right? I think it will help us to go through these difficult times that we're facing today. At least I hope they do. So please open your Bibles to the New Testament book of Ephesians, and we'll begin in chapter 1 and verse 1. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Ephesians 1, verse 1, says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and, under, and on earth under Christ. In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Ephesians. That Lord, help us as individuals. Help us as a church. Lord, I pray that uh, you, you open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us today. Lord, that you, you bring some understanding and some of that wisdom to us this morning. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, I pray that they don't leave here without coming to know you as their Lord and Savior. We give you all the praise and thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you bestow on us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as we begin here in verse 1, we see that Paul is indeed the author, and it was written to believers. Paul calls them God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And as in many of Paul's letters, the greeting is kind of the same. He says, grace and peace to you. And the word grace here is, is, means favor from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And peace is the harmonious relationship we can have with one another as well as with God. So grace, favor on you from God, and peace, peace with one another and from God. And peace is also given by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just those two words, grace and peace, right? We as believers have received these two things. We have received grace and peace and those two words have a, because we have those two things, we have a lot to offer to people around us. I mean, how huge would it be for someone who needs it today to find and receive grace and peace? 
The people who are confused and upset need grace and peace, right? Those rioters that are bent on destruction, believing that all they can do is tear things down and to solve the problems of our country, they need grace and peace. What I mean is these two simple words that Paul uses to begin his letter is what people need today. Two little words that we just gloss over as we begin reading this letter is what people need to have a changed heart and to have changed lives. Grace and peace. And, and because of that, this morning's message is called, Oh, What a Blessing. Oh, What a Blessing. And it's obvious as we begin the study in Ephesians that Paul wants to make his readers aware that God blesses his people. We are blessed in so many ways. And I'm afraid we take it for granted. And here's the thing, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, right? Of taking for granted the blessings that God has, has given us. I'll tell you what, I love it. That's why I love when somebody gets saved, right? There's an excitement about them. There's an excitement in their life. They're, they're excited because they realize what they have been saved from. And they're excited about that. They're excited because they now have blessings in their life that they never have ever had before. It wakes people up and it brings, you know, when somebody gets saved in our congregation and, and we see the excitement and it wakes us up and brings to memory to all of those who have been believers for years what a blessing it is that Jesus saved us. God's blessings are not always tangible. And that is, they're not always things we can, we can see. They're not always things we can, can hold. They're not things we can put in our pockets but they're amazing blessings nonetheless. As I said, this is a prison epistle. And he was in prison. I believe what Paul was thinking about when he was in prison, he, you know, he had time to think about such things. And, and he thought about all the most important ways that God blesses his people. And one of those blessings is that they are chosen. They are chosen. Verse 3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, every, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be homely and blameless in his sight. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then it says here in chapter 1, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, and these spiritual blessings far outweigh the physical blessings we can receive. Our salvation is a much greater blessing than if God blessed us with a million dollars apiece. Because physical blessings are temporary, but spiritual blessings are eternal. And the amazing thing about the spiritual blessings is that not only are, are we chosen to be God's children, but he, he chose us to be that way before he set one brick in the foundation of the world. Before one Adam was created, he chose us in him. This means... He didn't look at us to see if we're worthy to be saved. He didn't wait to see if we're going to be really good or really bad people. In our salvation, he did it all from beginning to end. And it didn't depend on any of us or any part that we played in it. Before he created anything, he said, Brent, I'm going to save you. Now, there's a lot of discussion about being chosen and election and predestination and all those theological terms that we can come up with. And, and I've talked about this before as well. But listen, if God wouldn't have chose any of us, we wouldn't have looked to him to be saved. It says here in the book of Isaiah, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're all guilty. We all stray. We all don't look for God. It says so in Romans 3. It says Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, having, having said that and backed up that assertion with Scripture here, the Lord is not going to save anyone against their will. That is, even though a person is chosen, it's a person's responsibility to believe. God chose you to be saved through belief in the truth. 
2 Thessalonians says, because, because God chose you, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit through the belief in the truth. As a matter of fact, right here in, in, in chapter 1, verse 13, it says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. So, does God do all the work in our salvation? Yes. Does God elect people and predestine them to be saved? Yes. Do I, so then do I have any responsibility on my part in order to be saved? Yes. You must believe the gospel. I've used this illustration before, but it comes from good old J. Vernon McGee. If you've ever listened to him or heard him or watched him or read any of his books, he says the moment of our salvation is like a gateway with an arch, okay? On this side of it, above the arch, it says, for whosoever will. For whosoever will. You hear the gospel, you believe the message, you walk through that gate of salvation, and you turn around and you look back, and on this side of the arch, it says, chosen from the foundation of the world. That's a good illustration. Let's face it. However you look at it, However, whatever you believe, this doctrine of theology, whatever you think about that, the fact remains that our salvation is a blessing and it's an awesome thing. Amen. It's an awesome blessing. Another way believers in Christ are blessed is they are family. Not only are they chosen, but they are family. Verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. I think as believers, I think sometimes here's where we fall short of, of, of understanding the blessings we have uh, when we become believers. Because at the moment of our conversion, we get adopted into God's family. He is now our Father. When we get saved, we get adopted into the family of God. So make no mistake, to be a child of God, you must be born again into the family of God. Now, under Roman law, during the time that this, Paul had, had wrote this, an adopted son enjoyed the same status and privileges as a real son, and it's that way today. When a couple adopt a child, that child has just as much legal rights as any natural-born child into that family. Adoption into God's family is the act of God by which his born ones have an adult standing in the family. He does this so that we can receive the blessings of being his child here and now today. And I think that's where we fall short. We come up, we, we, we don't understand that. We have the blessings of being in God's family, and we get those blessings here today. But, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes we forget we are God's children. We have all the rights as well as all the responsibilities that go along with being his child. We sing a song, No Longer Slaves. And I believe the writer of this song, this, this song uh, was writing in part about Ephesians chapter 1. It sa the, the song goes, and here's a verse, it says, From my mother's womb you have chosen me, love has called my name. I've been born again into a family, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. That's right, what we're talking about right there, that verse. American Express, if you ever remember the old American Express commercials, used to say uh, membership has its privileges. And so does being a child of God. Don't forget that. Being a child of God, you get privileges, and, and privileges and benefits we can use today. But as I said, just being a son or a daughter in God's family also means we have responsibilities too. As God's children... Let me just say this. We need to act like it. We need to talk like it. We've been going over this a few weeks too. Especially during this time of unrest and uncertainty in our country, God's children need to act a little different, right? We need to be different than the people around us. And as members of, of God's family where, where we get these benefits, we need to help grow that family. We need to help grow the kingdom, God's family. We want everyone we know to become part of God's family because we know that it will help grow the kingdom. It will help them, 
And in doing so, our Father will be pleased with us. How how much do we want to please our Father, right? Helping to grow the kingdom pleases our Father. It's a blessing. We're family. Another blessing that believers receive is that they are recipients of grace. Verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. This verse is pretty much self-explanatory. But if you're here this morning, you're watching on Facebook, or, and you don't know about or understand God's grace, then let me tell you about God's grace. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. Amen? God's grace is the most wonderful thing in the world because grace is a gift that none of us deserve, but God gives it to us anyway. It is a favor from God that doesn't cost us a thing. He freely gives it, and he gives us all that we need. And and although he bestows it freely upon us as his children and as his chosen ones and as people who believe in the truth, it cost him a great deal. John 3, 16, you all know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I don't want to dwell on this too long because we're going to cover it in chapter 2 as we get to that. But chapter 2, verse 8 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Simply put, God's grace is a blessing. A blessing that we don't deserve. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. In him we also have chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. What we see in these verses is the acts of blessing. Verse 1 through 5, Paul gave a big picture of God's blessings, and here he says, let me break it down for you a little bit. Let me get a little more specific here about what I'm talking about. Now here's the thing, Paul doesn't give us an exhaustive list of blessings that we receive from God, right? Right? But what he does do here in chapter 1 is he gives us the blessings that are pertinent to the letter, what are pertinent to the people of Ephesus. And although this became a circular letter and is read in other churches and eventually became scripture for us today, it was still personal to the people at the church of Ephesus. And, And we see here that through Christ, we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed. Redemption is a financial term. If someone gives you a gift card and you take it to the store and you buy items with that card, you have redeemed that card. If you go to the grocery store and you spend so much on certain items, you get points for for cents off for gasoline. When you go to get that gas and you get those cents off, you have redeemed those points. So, the biblical idea of redemption following along those lines, it has a certain financial aspect to it. But it also has a view of slavery. Slavery. To be be redeemed means to be bought back. There's a transaction that has taken place. Being redeemed has the sense of being set free from your slave position. And then becoming the child of God we talked about earlier. You may think, listen, buddy, I'm nobody's slave, never was, never will be. But unfortunately, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you most definitely are a slave to sin. Jesus said in John 8, 34, Truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Romans 6, 16 says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But being redeemed by Christ, by being redeemed by Christ, we are freed from sin. That is, you're freed from the power that sin has over you. Before coming to Christ, while you were still a slave to sin, 
you, you were that. You were a slave to sin instead of a slave to righteousness. You couldn't help but sin. Sin held you in its grip, in its clutches. It had power over you. You couldn't help but sin. That's what you did. But by believing in Jesus, sin has lost its power. So not only has redemption set you free from the bondage of sin, it has also set you free from the penalty of that sin. Those sins you have done, past, present, future, gone. Completely gone. Psalm 103 tells us as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he separates our sins from us. And it's all because Jesus paid the price for the sins that you owe. When he died on the cross, Jesus literally paid for your sin with his shed blood. And you don't think, if you don't think redemption is, a, is not important, you better think again. And as believers, we must count redemption as part of a blessing, as a blessing and think about it because we need to remember the cost and what Jesus paid for us. Only through Christ are we redeemed and only through Christ are we forgiven. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness, that's a topic for, for another sermon, an entire message, maybe another series, but for today, this is just the introduction more or less to the book of Ephesians. Redemption and forgiveness go together. You can't have one without the other. It's like repentance and faith. They go together. It's like two sides of the same coin. You know, we have, we have redemption, forgiveness. And, and here's the thing. Just consider this. If you have been redeemed, then you have been forgiven. What I mean is, and, and I'm going to aim this at, at people those of you who struggle with your past actions. If the Lord Jesus has redeemed you with his own life's blood, if he has set you free, if he has separated you from your sin, as he says, as far as the east is from the west, and they are paid for, and they, they've been purchased, they've been redeemed. If, if the Lord says, I will remember them no more, I will never hold them against you, then why in the world are you holding on to them? Why are you letting Satan hold you back by whispering in your ear, you're not good enough, you never will be, you think you're a Christian, how can you be when you do things like this? And don't tell me you have not heard those things, right? Listen, I've said before and I'll say it again, the only thing the devil can do to a real believer is make you an ineffective Christian. And he's good at that. He knows he, he has lost you when, he, when you put your trust in Christ. He has no power over you, but he don't give up easy. He's still going to mess with you. He's still going to tell you these lies. He's not going to leave you alone without a fight, and all he can do is cast doubt into your life. And many times, here's the problem, we fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. Jesus said in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So let it go. And get on with your Christian walk. Get on with your Christian life. Become mature believers. Grow in the grace that God has given you. Now here's the thing. There's a difference in seeking real forgiveness and seeking to be excused. Many times as believers, we think that forgiveness consists of God just ignoring what we've done. Like he'll pretend it didn't happen, right? But here's the thing. God doesn't excuse us. He forgives us. There's a difference. He doesn't pretend that it didn't happen, but he has made a way for your sin to be dealt with and to be gone forever. Sin is never excused, but because it must be dealt with, it must be paid for. And that's where the work of Jesus on the cross comes in. C.S. Lewis said, forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology and I will never hold it against you. Everything between us will be exactly as it was before. That's what forgiveness is. Excusing, though, says, I see what, that you couldn't help it or you didn't mean it. You really aren't to blame. And you know what? That's the way that it is with the world today. No one wants to take responsibility. No one wants to take blame for their actions. It's not my fault. It was my family's fault. It, it, I was mistreated. It, it's society's fault. I was born this way. But here's the thing. If no one is to blame, then there's nothing to forgive, right? Right? That's why 
To become a Christian, there must be repentance. Where the individual says, Lord, I know I've sinned against you. I want my life to change. I don't want to sin no more. I don't want to do these things. Lord, I just need your forgiveness. Through Christ, there's redemption. Through Christ, there's forgiveness. And through Christ, we have an inheritance. Verse 11. In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of, for him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Now, here's the thing. The NIV here says, in him we were also chosen, okay? And the meaning of chosen here is different from the meaning of chosen that we looked at before. There are two different Greek words, but they're translated as chosen into the English, right? The Greek word literally means to be appointed, to be appointed by lot. And that's in the NIV. Every other translation I looked at says, in him we have an inheritance. And, and so you're appointed to have that inheritance. We have that inheritance. And in Christ, it's a wonderful inheritance. 1 Peter 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope. Through, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept for you in heaven. So in the sense of this word, we have an inheritance, and we, we are an inheritance. Not only do we have that inheritance, but we are an inheritance. And Warren Wisby said that, that we, we are that way because we are valuable to him. We are his children. We are bought with a price. He redeemed us with his blood. That's how much he loves us. Verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. As I said, God's blessings are not always physical blessings that we can hold, that we can see. They're oftentimes blessings that, that can only be realized by, by watching God work in your life. And, and, or there, there are things that are revealed to us in Scripture. And these last two verses, what we see is revealed as unseen blessings. And the greatest unseen blessing that believers have is the Holy Spirit. Look, we are very fortunate to be living in this time, this age, the church age. Prior to Christ coming to earth and living a perfect life and dying on the cross and ascending into heaven, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in people's hearts. As you read the Old Testament, you see the Holy Spirit descending and coming upon someone in order for them to, to complete a task, to do a job for God. And once they got it done, they, the Holy Spirit would then leave that person. The Holy Spirit gave that person supernatural power to get it done, but he never dwelled within that person. But then Jesus came, and he promised his disciples that when he was gone, he would send the Spirit of truth to comfort and to guide. Je Jesus promised them, I will not leave you as orphans. If you're a believer today, you have that same promise. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to lead you, to guide you, to bring you comfort and understanding. It's what Colossians 1.27 calls Christ in you, the hope of glory. And one of those blessings that come through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is that the Holy Spirit reveals truth. Everyone I talk to anymore, they tell me, I don't know what to believe. No one is telling us the truth about this virus. One day it's one thing, the next day it's something else. We, we, can't, we have nothing to hang our hat on because everybody has a different opinion. It depends on what day it is. I don't know what to believe. I can't figure out who's telling the truth. Let me lay some real truth on you right now. God is not a liar. Actually, it is Satan who is the liar and called the father of lies, right? God's word is truth. Every word cover to cover. Even the things, when we read it, it's like, oh, that hurts. I don't like that part. But it's truth, right? Old Testament true. New Testament's true. The complete Word of God is for us to know what it is that God wants us to know. 
And the main thing we need to know in the whole Bible is Jesus saves. And it is God the Holy Spirit that reveals this to us. It's called conviction. And listen, if you ever get convicted by one of my sermons, chances are it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit working with you and working in you. Trust me. Here's the thing I've told you many times. I've, I've sat in a pew a lot longer than I've been up here being a preacher, right? I've been convicted. I, I, know what it, what it, I know when the Holy Spirit speaks, right? And, and I've struggled sometimes with, with reading the Bible. I, I still do today. We struggle with what the Holy Spirit is, is because He's changing us. And sometimes change is not pleasant. And it's like, man, I, I don't really want to do that, Lord. But then the Holy Spirit says, you go ahead and do that. I struggle with it, you know, certain passages and the doctrines as well. I've struggled with those, you know, and I, like I said, every time I read and, and I study, I struggle with some passages. But just keep reading, keep studying, and the Holy Spirit will help you and give you the understanding. But understand, though, the Holy Spirit will not do those things for you until you have been redeemed. You must repent of your sin and, and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then at the moment of your conversion, the Holy Spirit will come into your life. If you've never trusted in Jesus, if you're that person, then the first truth that the Holy Spirit gives a person is the conviction of that person. You know what? You need to be saved. He tells you you're a sinner. And, and, and you will stand before God and you will be accountable for your sin someday. So you need a Savior. You need Jesus to save you. I received that blessing many years ago when the Holy Spirit called me to be saved, when I heard the gospel of truth as, it, as we talked about today. And the day I repented and put my trust in Jesus was the most blessed day I've ever had in my life. And it can be yours today. Today is the day of salvation. You can be saved from your sin and the penalty of that sin. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit seals us. This is another thing we're going to be talking about as we go along, but the Holy Spirit seals us. All believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I mean, God is within us. What else can get in, right? We are sealed. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You dear children are from God and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, right? Satan cannot touch a child of God. He cannot possess them. You can no longer use the excuse, the devil made me do it, because sin and Satan has no power over a believer. Now you can be tempted and you can still sin, but you no longer have to. You can say, not today, Satan, and get along with your day, Right? You've been sealed. And lastly, the Holy Spirit guarantees our eternity. He guarantees our eternity. The grace that God gives is a sure thing. You can never lose it. Salvation is of the Lord. So in that respect, He makes sure you keep it, right? The Holy Spirit dwelling in our heart guarantees that. It guarantees that your salvation and your eternity are sure. The Holy Spirit that is given to all believers is a down payment for what is to come. So it's a deposit. It's a first installment of the token payment to assure full payment will follow. I like what one commentator said. He said, for the believer, the Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring. It's great for now, right? It's great for now, but you know it will lead to a better day and a better life. Oh, what a blessing we have because of what God has done for His people. I'm telling you. This week, go back over the text we went through this morning. Then continue to read through the book of Ephesians, and I'm sure you'll be blessed. Praise team's going to come here in a minute and, and close us in a song. And, you know, we've been doing things differently. We have to... Uh, dismiss through the back and, and go back at, you know... As, was pointed out, go into the parking lot and fellowship if you want to. Can't hang out. Uh, but I'm telling you what, if you want to talk about how to be saved, meet me back in my office after the service and I'll gladly talk to you. Um, we'll do that that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for everything. The blessings that you give, man, Lord, I apologize for taking them for granted. 
It's when we read your word and it's pointed out to us just how wonderful you are and just what you've given us. And, and Lord, you give it to us and we don't deserve a thing. That's how wonderful you are. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us to count those blessings, to consider those blessings, to remember the cost that it cost you to redeem us. And Lord, not to ever lose sight of that. Lord, help us to be a church here in Pittsfield that you want us to be. Help us through the book of Ephesians obtain that. And Lord, so that we never, ever, ever lose our first love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to uh, thank you for choosing me to be a part of your family, Lord. And I just thank you for putting me in the earthly family that you put me in that could make it so easy for me to, uh, to join you in, in your love, and Lord. And there are so many different things that we need to pray for that uh, sometimes we just don't know the words. So I just thank you for the Holy Spirit that uh, you give us to be in our heart who can... Who can uh, Pray for us that uh, when we don't have the words to uh, express our, our, our love and our feelings. So I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.